All right, so today's goal is to model a diaphragm cell, which pretty much the only good thing about it is it allows us to get the, the ropes or the, the hang of modeling pseudo steady state diffusion. So this is one of my least favorite examples just because it takes a lot of mathematical tricks to be able to solve it um, in a good way. So let me explain basically how the problem works. You have some sort of apparatus here with two chambers, an upper chamber and a lower chamber. Um, in the one of the chambers you have high concentration of something and in one of the chambers you have virtually well, no concentration of that. So we have a bunch of red dots over here, that's molecules. Uh, in the other chamber, we have absolutely nothing. If we zoom in on this interface over here, what you see is this right here, which we are making our membrane. So there is a permeable membrane here where molecules from one of the chambers could enter the other chamber. So it is essentially our thin film. It has a length across the membrane. Remember our length is always across the membrane. It's basically the thickness of the membrane of L and it also has an area. Now note that the area is not this. It's not the rectangle that you're seeing here. It's actually if you're looking at it from the side. Uh, it's the surface of this wall over here if you just look at one of these black lines right here. Okay, So it's got some cross-sectional area. It's got a thickness that we're going to call L and Basically, you got molecules moving from one side uh, to the other side. So that's something that you've seen uh, many times before. The difficulty is that what exactly is happening in the problem? Well, you have a high concentration cell and a low concentration cell, and the concentration um, as a function of time is going to be changing. You're going to see a lower and lower concentration on this side and you're going to see a higher and higher concentration on this side. In the previous problems we sort of assumed that both sides were reservoirs and the actual concentration of each side of the cells wasn't going to change that much as a function of time. Um, now we actually have it where the concentration of each of these cells will change as a function of time. So how are we actually going to handle it? Well we're going to use a pseudo steady state approximation. What we're going to say is that in the membrane, in the actual film region, we can pretty much say that that's simply just thin film uh, diffusion. So our thin film solution from the very first lecture is going to be just fine here. And remember that's always going to be the diffusivity divided by L times some sort of concentration difference. And in this case, if we want the flux to be positive, it's going to be the concentration difference that is going to be positive. So it's going to be the high concentration minus the low concentration. Uh, for this particular example, we'll say that suppose the high concentration is going to be in the upper chamber. You might see an example of this problem with the high concentration cell is the lower chamber. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to say, say the high concentration is going to be in the upper chamber. So we could essentially convert this line here to say, okay, it's a concentration difference between the upper chamber, which is high in concentration, minus the lower uh, chamber, which is low in concentration. Okay, so now for the tricky part. We can model the membrane or what's going on in this membrane, but now we need to figure out how we're going to model the chambers because they're going to be time dependent. The membrane is not going to be time dependent. It's going to approach a steady state value, but each of the chambers uh, will be time dependent. That's what we mean by pseudo steady state. This is steady state, but these aren't steady state. The way we model the problem is combining those two um, aspects together, the unsteady state aspect of each of the chambers with the steady state aspect of the permeable membrane. So in the upper cell, let's take a small look at the generalized mass balance that happens there. So you're always going to start with this in minus out plus generation minus consumption equals accumulation. And in the upper cell, what terms do we have? And you need to be careful here. So in the upper cell, um, there's no reaction happening, so there's no generation and there's no consumption. And remember, for the upper cell, we're having the movement of molecules from here to the lower cell. So here, there's something going out, but is there anything coming in? Uh, is there any molecules coming in from the lower chamber? And the answer to that is no. So the only thing you have here is the out term and the accumulation term. Uh, and the accumulation term, we really mean um, the concentration of the upper cell is going to be changing over time. So our generalized mass balance is going to simplify to minus out equals accumulation. 
Uh, what occurs next is going to be the most difficult part to explain uh, to you, and this is just something you might even have to take at face value uh, until you get really good at using the diffusion convection equation. So transforming this English to this mathematical expression takes a little bit of explanation. So this zero here comes from the in, there's nothing coming in, um, but the out over here looks like this. So remember, whenever you're writing a generalized mass balance, you're always conserving something, either moles per time or moles. Um, if you remember the units of flux, they're in moles per area time. So I'm taking the flux, I'm multiplying it by the area, and I'm multiplying it by time. So if it's moles per area time, times area times time, what I'm saying is that on the left-hand side of this equation, everything is in terms of time. To make that even more apparent, I'm gonna put that right over here. I'm gonna get rid of the negative sign. So this is what we did over here. So we also need whatever's on the right-hand side, um, if we're adding or subtracting for the dimensions to work out, they need to be in units of moles. So concentration, you might remember, is in moles per volume. Um, so we need to multiply that by a volume, because that's going to give us moles. Um, since concentration, we're saying, is now a function of time, we're saying it's going to be evaluated at t plus delta t, and respectively, it's going to be evaluated at t. Why are we subtracting this from this? Well, we're saying it's going to be a change in concentration, right? So whenever you're doing a change, it's going to be final minus initial. So final is at some later time, t plus delta t, and initial is at some time t. The way it looks when you look at the unit analysis simply looks like this. Okay, now we're going to use our favorite trick that we use every single time. We're gonna say, okay, look at what's going on over here. We have a t plus delta t, we have a t, we have a difference, and we have a delta t over here. Let's see what we do exactly. Um, every single time we make a generalized mass balance, let's move that over here, and now you have something that looks very, very similar to the derivative definition. So at this point in time, all you need to do is take the limit as delta t goes to zero, and now you've converted this to a differential equation. The other thing we know is that while the concentration in this cell changes per time, it's still rigid, right? This box is rigid, so the actual volume that is contained in that box won't change, because everything's fluid, right? The volume of the box is just going to be the volume of the box, which means you could pull it out of this differential, and now we have this expression. The flux times the area is going to be equal to um, the volume of the upper chamber times the change of the upper chamber's concentration over time. Okay, now hopefully you'll buy that everything in the lower chamber is going to be incredibly similar. It's going to be a symmetric argument. So instead of having out, the only thing that's happening in the lower chamber is molecules from here are moving into the lower chamber. So your generalized mass balance equation is going to simplify to simply n equals the accumulation. And by symmetry, um, you're still gonna have the flux of species A times the area, but it's not gonna have that minus sign in front of it. So now you're simply going to have just this. It's gonna be the volume of the lower chamber times the change of concentration per time in the lower chamber, but over here it's gonna be exactly the same, just without the minus sign. Okay, cool. Now we have enough information to solve the problem. So like I said before, it's a pseudo steady state problem, which means that we're going to take the aspects that are unsteady state. So the concentration changes in the upper and lower chambers and we're gonna combine it with the steady state aspect of the thin film that separates them. And this is where it pretty much just becomes mathematical tricks. So if I don't explain things, it's because there's really no explanation other than the fact that this is how people solved the problem. The first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to divide each of these expressions by their respective volume. So we divide by V upper on both sides over here, and we divide by V lower on both sides over here. And now you see that we have a DCTT over here and a DCDT over here. And you're saying, okay, maybe it sort of makes sense while we're doing this, we're trying to slowly combine them. Um, 
So now what we're going to dig is we're going to say, okay, we're going to do this minus that. So if you subtract two equations from each other, on the left-hand side, you're going to get this minus this, and on the right-hand side, you're going to get both the dt dt's subtracted by each other. Okay, now what are we going to do? Well, if we have the derivative of this and the derivative of this, since the derivative is a linear operator, what we could say is that this minus this is going to be dt of this difference. Now hopefully you're seeing what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create an easy differential equation that we could solve if we just basically call this our function. Okay, so we need to incorporate that thin film diffusion into our model. How are we going to do it? Well, first thing we're going to do is we're going to pull this away so we have it a little bit cleaner. We have this volume mess over here, and we have the total flux of A times the area out here on the left hand side. And now we're just going to go for it. So we're going to take thin film solution, and we're going to sub it in there for n sub a. And what we're going to get is something that looks like an algebraic nightmare. That's going to look like this. So now we're going to make some simplifications so you can actually understand what's going on in the problem. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we want to solve the differential equation between this guy and this guy over here. So we're going to say, all right, simplify it, make a placeholder variable f, and call it the difference between the upper and lower chamber concentrations. So now our equation looks much nicer notationally. Um, we have f on one side and we have df dt on the other side. The other thing we want to do is we want to get rid of this mess of constants over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say introduce a new variable called beta that just combines a bunch of these constants together. So now we have an even easier equation to look at. Uh, if you do the math, you'll get f on one side, df dt on the other side, and just some constants sort of chilling out over there. Okay, now that things are nice, we're just going to solve in the same way that we do every single time. We're going to separate variables. So put the f's on the right-hand side, uh, move dt over there with constants. We integrate once. Uh, we take the indefinite integral, of course. Uh, this will go to ln, this will go to t, and then we need to introduce a new constant, k0. And at this point, we could even introduce um, an even easier way of doing it. We could just say we have this boundary condition at time 0, that whatever the function is, it's going to be at some initial value. What that tells us is that this term will drop out when we make that boundary condition and that we'll have to move this over so that k0 is going to be negative ln of f0. Okay, so far so good. Going back here and substituting in the value of k0, we get this. If you remember your rules of logs, it means that we can uh, group the log terms together and say that they're just being divided within the natural log. And now we can actually solve for um, our function. That's going to look like this. Now at this point, we should unwrap what F was. F was the difference between the concentration in the upper and the lower chambers. So your final uh, concentration profile, I guess you could call it, or your concentration difference is going to look like this. The difference between the concentration profiles, well the concentration of the upper and lower cells at some time t is going to be um, dependent upon the initial difference in their concentrations and an exponential term containing uh, the parameters for the thin film, the volumes of the chambers, the diffusivity, and of course time. Okay, but that isn't really why people actually solve this problem. What people are interested in is getting this diffusion constant or the diffusivity of the material D. So if you go back to a previous step uh, which I believe will be this one. So if we bring this down here, and instead this time we try isolating D, we can use the negative sign to flip um, what's going on in the LN over here. Uh, this is supposed to be up here. And we're going to divide by beta times time. Now, if we expand again, knowing what F0 and F are, we get something that looks like this. 
And I'm gonna move the airline once again up here because those that being that T should not be uh, in the natural log. So now we have an explicit expression for the diffusion constant D as long as you know what beta was. And beta was the area over the length times whatever is going on here. So this is the point. The point is that this diaphragm cell or this Arnold cell pretty much only exists so that you can find out what the diffusion constant of a particular substance is. That's the reason why we do this problem. That's the reason why the Arnold cell or the diffusion cell or the diaphragm cell rather is important because you know the area and the length of the thin film if you constructed it. You know the volume of the upper and lower cell if you constructed the diaphragm cell. Um, you could know the initial concentration of both the cells um, by whatever you put into the Arnold cell. And then at some time, you could basically take a sample from the upper and lower chambers, uh, use something like the Beer-Lambert law or an HPLC to figure out the concentration of each of those. And then you have all of these known. You know this, you know this, you know this, you know this. You know all the expressions in here. And you know the time when you took the concentration in the cells. And that allows you to solve for the diffusion coefficient. So any of the diffusion coefficients that we see later on, they've been figured out through the use of this Arnold cell. That's the only reason why this problem is useful. Um, so this is going to be a footnote. If you got everything up above, uh, ignore this. This won't be that interesting to you. So. What if you wanted to model the problem using the diffusion convection equation instead? Well, then initially you're going to have it look like this. Uh, you're gonna say there's no reaction occurring in the upper chamber. And then after that, you're gonna say, once again, it's a one dimensional problem. And then this is why I didn't initially use the diffusion convection equation to describe this problem. Um, it gets a little bit unconvincing. You, it gets as arbitrary as the other method. So here you multiply by volume on both sides, and then you say, okay, well, D, D, Z is approximately um, one over delta Z, and volume is approximately area times delta Z, so those essentially cancel out, and you get the exact same um, expression you had if you use the generalized mass balance. If you're a little bit unconvinced by this, I was also a little bit unconvinced by this, uh, you could also say that you move the DZ over to the other side, perhaps do uh, the indefinite integral, which is still kind of lame because you ignore the constant in the next step. So the, the integral is approximately going to be delta Z, and then you could divide by delta z on this side, and then do the exact same thing over here, where you multiply by the volume and make this sub like simplification over here to get this as your final result for your setup.